Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Troshu Mayor Barry Koletke. The heart of Troshu makes this gem of a town an incredible place to live. You'll be hard-pressed to find a place jam-packed with more community spirit than Troshu. Troshu offers the small town benefits with all the essential services one needs. Great recreational facilities, full K-12 to modernized school, a golf course, a community fitness center, beautiful green spaces, medical facilities, restaurants, shopping, and so much more. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border mayor, Barry Kaletke. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking you a simple question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Barry? Well, I'll go back in time. I never really thought that I would have a sense to serve my community. Um, but in 2001, I had a change in uh, careers after working 20 years in the elevator grain industry for a company called Alberta Wheat Pool. And I started my own business in Troshu, and there was one gentleman who, um, Troshu was having a by-election in 20, 2002, and one of the gentlemen kept coming in day after day saying, you need to run for the by-election, you need to run for the by-election, you need to run for the by-election. I said, no. He said, I I got too many um, strong opinions of things. And he said, no, I said, I think you'd be good. You'd, uh, you would you would help the um, balance the council of the day out a little bit. So after about the 20th business uh, visit of him coming in and asking me, I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And uh, in 2002, I did get into uh, as a counselor for the by-election. Um, I uh, I've lived here all my life, so born and raised here since 1964. So I'm dating myself, but I'm 60 years old. I'm proud to say Troche is my home and will likely be my home for the rest of my life. Um, so that's kind of I. I do have a passion for my community. I didn't realize how much of a passion until I got into politics. And I I still have a problem of calling um, politicians that are hired me uh, out, like uh, MLAs and MPs, when we are, in fact, politicians at the municipal level, too. So it's been a great journey along the way. I've been mayor since 20, 2004, so I'm on my 20th year or 21st year, I should say. So I, I, okay. So there, I, I find your story fascinating because I did a deep dive on you and I went down a rabbit hole. I don't think I thought, I think I should have, but not only are you mayor of your community, but you're also a school board trustee for the golden Hills school division in your community as well. For someone who has strong opinions do you get time off? Do you get some downtime? Because I can imagine those two jobs keep you quite busy in a small community like yours. Yeah, um, it, it does. Uh, uh, being the mayor, it keeps me uh, very busy because it's right here in Troshu. Um, being a trustee, I represent Troshu and Three Hills, and uh, we have meetings down in Strathmore. So I got probably about 15 or 18 meetings a year with the school board. 
and with the with the town um i'm basically in the town office every day to find out what's going on if there's anything new happening um i did become a school board trustee with a mission on our minds uh on my on the town's mind um we had a uh, school had been on the replacement list for probably about 15 years and we just kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And finally I said, well, if we want to make this happen, we have to have a strong voice at the table. So got to the table, knowing that I'm only one voice of uh, seven at that time, trustees. But you had to build a case on why Troshu needed to be prioritized. And so uh, at that point in time, Troshu had two schools. One was a K-3 to school and the other one was a grade four to six school. And uh, so when I got on the school board, you know, I quickly learned what the government of the day was looking for. And they were looking at they were looking at schools that were at capacity. If you could get your school to capacity, um, what they consider capacity is 80, 85 percent um, uh, um, full, um, then then you get bumped up the list very, very fast. Uh, so what we did was we ended up doing a closure of the K-3 school, which come with a little pushback from the community because uh, it was kind of like its own little kingdom. Uh, we moved the kids over to the uh, grade four to um, uh, 12 school. And lo and behold, uh, two years after that, we get announced for a new school replacement. Uh, so it was 50% replaced, 50% 50, 50 modernized. But then the, the story in 2013 or 14, we opened a, uh, a brand new spectacular school with a spectacular gymnasium and a uh, fitness center attached to it, which the community helped fundraise for uh, enhanced gymnasium and fitness center. Well, that's awesome. It, it, it sounds from what I've read on your website and even truly uh, Troshu is truly a like a community minded uh, town uh, because everyone seems so close knit from what I can gather. Um, and I would agree with that. Um, Troshu was uh, was 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 originated uh, through uh, French French immigration uh, that's where troshu come from was a, a guy named armin troshu um and as we've grown over the last number of years we've realized that we had to rely on immigration again although it may be a little bit different looking uh, we've got a, a ton of filipinos in our community um, we have one on our town council now and it's been awesome to get to know them and understand their culture and um, we're doing lots of lots of wonderful things to make sure that they want to stay in Troshu and not just uh, spend their time here until they get permanent residency and then head off to the cities. And we're doing a pretty good job of that. So I want to talk about the municipality for a few seconds and the role of council and yourself as mayor. For example roughly 25 years now have you seen the role of the municipality change dramatically over those 25 years or are you dealing with the same issues and i don't say same issues but similar issues that you were dealing with in 20 2002 when you first were elected or are you dealing with more bigger issues that you didn't think you'd be dealing with when you first got elected now well i'd say they're 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 different issues. I wouldn't <laughs> say they're bigger or small. They're different. Um, and of course, uh, inflate, inflated issues. <laughs> um, so no, uh, you know, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a community of about 1100 people is what we're figuring right now. And so it's, 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 it's tough to do things. Um, we do rely a lot on government grants in order to uh, build up our infrastructure um so whether that's coming from the municipal uh, from the fed uh provincial government or in some instances the federal government um we 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 don't have the capability to put money into reserves to replace aging infrastructure because our taxation in our communities in rural alberta is already very high we get downloaded a lot of a lot of tax from the from the provincial government, they like to download, make us be the bad guys, and and go and tax our residents more for things that uh, they like to do. Do you see that 
in my conversations with municipal leaders across Canada, I, I've been noticing that I've been hearing a lot about apathy when it comes to municipal governance and even municipal politics. Ten years ago, you could probably imagine seeing a few people in the council chambers talking and listening to what's going on. Now it would be hard-pressed to find one or two people who actually probably know what's on the agenda each week or every other week or when the agenda comes out. In your community, do you feel like people are connected on what is going on at town hall or is it that age-old adage as long as the garbage is picked up and my water's turned on in the morning when i go have a shower i'm comfortable with what the uh, the city government is doing you know i i take pride in saying this but i think that we've done a pretty good job a real good job of communicating with the community on what we're doing through um by by monthly newsletters um we do public consultations. Uh, there was a point in time where we had a few people uh, that would come and sit in council chambers and, and jot down notes. Um, we got a few that are coming by again. But it, but I think um, if you stay away from, and I'm not saying, if you're going to have a controversial issue, you need to build consensus before you start. You need to start putting, feeling Put, put floating floating balloons floating things out there before you pull the trigger on something you got to get the community support uh, before you start thinking about doing any type of radical or or any type of change what on the flip side of that and to play a little the devil's advocate with you for a second barry but you know you're not pleasing 100% of the people with the decisions you make at council, no matter what the decision is. I'm assuming after 20 some odd years, you've come to the realization that you're going to at least upset someone in your community. So how do you, because you're one vote and you're the mayor, how do you make the best decisions for the community with the understanding that you know you're going to potentially upset someone with the decision you make? Well, um, we have good <laughs> Uh, all some discussions uh, amongst council and sometimes um, some of the things we have to do go into closed session and um, we don't like to go into closed session very often but when we come out we try and have a, um, a consensus sometimes we do have hot button issues where we'll have a recorded vote but I would say for the most part um, I feel like we've come out we've made relatively good decisions and i'm going to go back to um covet when covet come out troshu and golden hill school division both decided we weren't going to be the public health people we weren't going to go and overreach what we needed to do to our residents or to our um our parents right we're, we were we're, we're, we're going to do what the government of the day was asking us but we weren't going to go out and stop garbage pickup. And uh, I know some communities that did that. And it was a complete disaster. Uh, residents just took the garbage and dumped it on the town office uh, lawn. So I, th I think we try and do, we try and make decisions that kind of keep people fairly happy, the majority. And you're right. We're not going to ever keep everybody happy. There's some people who just, you, you can't make them happy. Is it hard? Is it hard to make the best decision? Because let's take in the context of this year, and I'm not pointing out any fingers. I'm not, and this is just a random question I just need to ask because we're in a very tough year this year economically. A lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. But you as a municipality know that you have to collect taxes. You have to run your services. You have to collect garbage. You have to service the water. And that doesn't come free and you have to potentially charge people a little bit more. And I'm, I'm not sure what the, if there's an increase or if it's zero, but you have to make those tough decisions. Does it get easier to make those tough decisions at the end of the day, or does it still weigh on you when you have to look at a potential dollar figure that you have to increase or charge to your residents? I, I would say it'll, no one ever wants to charge the residents more. Um, but the residents also never want less. <laughs> so they want great. They want good water, safe, clean water. They want uh, somewhere to flush their water to. Um, they don't like the potholes in the roads. Um, <laughs> but they also don't like to raise taxes. Um, and we've been, 
pretty good over the years. This year we didn't have a uh, tax rate increase. So, um, but, you know, in small towns, it's tough because we've got, you know, taxation is our, is our main source of revenue. Our other source is fees, uh, which we charge for garbage and water and sewer. And then the third one is grants. So we're relying on, you know, a federal and provincial governments, so maybe some help from our county friends. The thing that the that the towns don't have is they don't have the capability of accessing the money from linear taxation. Um, and that is one thing that um, uh, it, if we could figure out a way to share a little better, I think a lot of small municipalities would have it a lot easier. But I'm don't want to get in any trouble on that one either. And I, I won't press you on that a little bit, but I'm going to turn my last question before we turn to the town as a whole. And I want to talk about the jurisdictional role. You know what the municipality's role is at the end of the day. You know what you're responsible for and what you need to look after in the governmental system. But I would hazard a guess, and I hate to paint a broad stroke, but I kind of do on this show, but I would hazard a guess that the residents of your community probably understand that you the, you as the municipality play a role in their lives, but they will probably come to you and ask you about educational issues. And I know that's a weird question to talk to you because you're literally a school board trustee, but they may come to talk to you about healthcare. They may come talk to you about issues that are going on provincially because you are the closest to them. Do you get a sense in your community that the role the municipality plays and they will go to their MLA or MP with their issues federally or provincially? Or are they just coming to you because you're the closest, they know who Barry is because I read an article about you in 2015. You you have the wardrobe of Don Cherry, basically, and you're a very flashy guy. So are people coming to you with all their issues and you then go talk to the MLA and MP about the issues that are facing of Toshu? Yeah. So people do come talk to me and when it's appropriate for me to um, give them a, an answer, I will. Um, but if it's something that needs to be deferred to an MLA or MP, I definitely know my role and say, that's not for me to answer or solve a letter or a call to the MP or MLA with help. It's also another thing that's um, a neat about being a school board trustee and a, and a councillor, a mayor for a small town, is that once you know your role, and it really, really, really is hard for some people to ever get over the hump of knowing their role. But we do only have one employee. So in the school board, it's the superintendent. The town, it's our CAO. And um, when people come and ask me administration questions, I simply have an answer if it's administration, you need to talk to our administrator. You need to talk to our CAO. We are in governance. And that, that doesn't mean I'm going to shut people down, but I'm not going to take up um, an issue with whether the um, landfill site was open on a, on a holiday Monday. Uh, no, you phone our administration, you talk to them. That's what administration's about. We have one employee, and that's our administrator, and the school board has the superintendent. When a parent phones me uh, with an issue at school, the first thing I ask them is, have you talked to the teacher? And surprisingly, a lot of the times they don't. And then the second question is, have you talked to the principal? Um, and, and again, a lot of times the answer is no. And by the time you're done doing those two things, the issues can a lot of the time be resolved. Understandable. Um I wasn't going to ask this, but I'm going to ask this because I think it's an important one because we are three years in, well, almost three years into your term. Next year, 2025 in Alberta, there is a provincial election. What advice would you give a potential candidate who's about to stand or thinking about standing for a municipal office or even school board trustee position that you wish you would have known when you first got into the office? Well, the, for sure, one of the things everybody should understand is, is try, and, try and go and get educated about what you're getting yourself into. 
understand your role, understand that if you have one burning issue that is driving you crazy and you don't like the garbage uh, pickup guy or you don't like a uh, teacher in the school and your only mission is to get on to council or school board to try and have someone fired, it doesn't work that way. So my, my, my suggestion would, would be um, a lot of communities, usually through the, munis, uh, um, through the county, have a, um, uh, someone come out and present to people, potential candidates, what they're signing up for and what their role is. And by the time the room starts with 40 people in, a, in, our, in our county, and by the time it's done, there might be 15 or 20 or whatever that put their name forward. Um, once they understand what they can and can't do. Um, it's easy to say, I'm going to do this, this, and this. But if you're not, if your mind isn't open and capable of persuasion, and if you can't have, uh, create people on your council or school board to also have a mind that's open and capable of, uh, capable of persuasion, you'll never get anywhere. So if you want to go in and just be a shithead, it's not going to fly. Ah, uh, thank God. At least someone's dropping the S-bombs on the show because you, it's usually me. Um, I want to turn to Troshu as an entire community now and as a town. And before I ask this starting question, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation on emotion of council, direction of council, policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. He is one vote on council and he needs a majority of votes to pass anything or move anything forward. What he might say might line up with what's going on in the community, but this is his opinion. Mayor, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenges facing Troshu today? So the, the, we, we got a few challenges, but of course, I, I, I mentioned it earlier, um, the downloading of costs uh, to the municipal government um, by the provincial government, federal governments, uh, the bureaucratic tape that you have to go through to get to a grant. Um, we've had some big things happen in Troshu in the last number of years. So I already talked about our school. Um, we did a $3 million upgrade to our lagoon. Um, that was done during COVID uh, in 2020. And uh, we got about two thirds funding on that. And we stacked our municipal sustainability initiative funding uh, on top of that for a number of years. So we didn't have to go back to the taxpayers to upgrade our lagoon. But the good news is our lagoon is uh, set up for an expansion to at least 2,500 people. Um, second thing is uh, about 12, 14 years ago, we bought our first uh, parcel, 40 acres of annexed land that we had uh, at a very good price. Um, and then about 10 years ago, we bought the second parcel at a uh, another very good price. It was indexed from the original price to real estate inflation. At that point in time, some people thought we were crazy. Why would we be buying land for the future when we didn't have development immediately coming in here? Well, you know, when you're in municipal politics in small towns, you can either think about just the next couple of years or you got to think about the next 15, 20, 25 years and whether you want to grow your community or close it off. Um, by having that 80 acres that we bought and had already annexed um, and, and by having the new uh, lagoon expansion, um, the town of Troshu uh, took on a project called Troshu Housing Corporation and it's a wholly owned subsidy of the town of Troshu and what it's doing is we're replacing our senior care facility continuing care facility um, St. Mary's which was started in 1911 by the nuns of Evron um, and we are uh, we, we finally got our government grants. We got 11.5 million from Alberta Health for the continuing care portion of the, of the, of the new build. We got 9.5 million from Alberta Seniors for the lodge portion of the new build. So there's gonna be 40 continuing care beds which will replace the existing beds at our St. Mary's Hospital. 
which is 70 years old. Um, and then we have uh, we had interest from the community on having life leases attached to um, this facility. Um, and we got so we got 18 life leases and we've got deposits on all 18 of them, um, which is pretty darn good and pretty big commitment from the community. We will be breaking ground this fall and uh, facilities planning on being open in April between April and July of 2027, you know, dependent on the weather, it could be a little bit sooner. So that was a big, a real big thing that, um, if we wouldn't have been future thinking with the 80 acres of land, uh, the 12 acre new facility is gonna be the key piece up there. And we've got, we've got some interest from developers already on that piece of land. So I, I just want to I want to jump in here for a second because I want to ask you a question that is something you just said because it's a question I ask all the time. I, I like the fact that your municipality is forward thinking. That's great. That's amazing. I think more municipalities need to be thinking about 10 years from now instead of 10 minutes from now. But the residents of your community, like you just said, will probably say, well, this isn't going to benefit me until 10 now and I need things here and now. How do you balance the future of your community with the people in your community now without making them feel like their tax dollars aren't being spent on them today? <laughs> well, that is a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, I think communications and, and, and knowing that people can come and talk to, to me or, or other counselors about what's going on um, I think when you explain to them, um, we had a neighbor to the south of us who had a uh, lagoon issue and their lagoon hit capacity. And um, then they needed to go and negotiate the, the price of land. Um, when they had to do that, the price was inflated probably three or four times what the real value would, would have been. So if you can explain to people um, and ask them, are we looking to grow? Or are we looking to stay just the way we are? Um, some people would say, we just want to stay the way we are. Then I ask them, well, would you like to sell your house down the road for more money or less money? And pretty much everybody wants to sell their house down the road for more money. So I said, well, if we're going to sell houses for more money, we have to grow. And if we, if we, if we want to grow, we can't wait until growth comes to us we do have to take some risk as a community to make sure we're set up for growth and there is a lot a lot of small communities in our in our area that are not set up to expand at all they got their they got their 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 town limits uh, they may have some uh, land annexed but annexed land only is as good as you as if you can come up with a price to to purchase it from someone you've annexed it from I'm not sure okay. whether I'm answering your questions. No, there, but... you are, you are. You answered my question quite well there. And I want to then turn back to the original thing about development, because you basically answered uh, my next question, which was going to be the chicken or the egg scenario, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Do you buy land and then development comes or do you wait? Development comes, then you wait, for them, which is great. So now the, the question has to be, are developers coming knocking? Do you find that people are saying, you know what, we want that lifestyle of small town, urban, rural living that we didn't get during the pandemic. So we're going to move into a smaller community, but we want a place like Troshu, but there's no houses. So are developers saying this is a prime time to start developing in Troshu, so let's do it? Or are you finding people apprehensive right now because of the economy? So I would say that we definitely have uh, more interest than ever from developers to come into Troshu and, and develop. Uh, we do have a basically zero vacancy. Um, uh, when I say zero vacancy, a house comes on the market and uh, had a friend who had a house on the golf course. He put it on the market on Monday or Tuesday this week, he had six showings and two offers and, uh, you know, the, 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 the house is sold. Um, the, the issue out here, and I wouldn't call it an issue is, is where do you find the, where do you find the 
the the correct the secret sauce on how to how how do you have a developer come in here and and build something that is suitable for the people that we have working in our community and and the and the mortgage amount that they can afford so we as a town have taken the attitude that we can't be the developers but we can make a developer a developer's experience in Troshu as great as anywhere else in the world we want to get out of the way of obstacles for you um, we don't want to slow down development we want to encourage development we want to make it easy um, so we do have some people that are looking and we're we have some people that are potentially looking at some townhomes and things like that that we haven't really got in Troshu before um, some duplexes, threeplexes, triplexes. Um, so, can I can I ask you a yes, tangible have, question? Yeah. What is the tangible yeah. item that council to incentivize people right now? Is there a bylaw that you've put in place? Is there something you've or repealed? Is there a tangible item that you've said, okay, in order to incentivize these developers to come in, this is what we need to do and this is what we have done? Or is this just early talks that we're having right now? Uh, so for incentives on the um, on the business or commercial side of things, we do have a five-year sliding tax forgiveness program um uh, year of construction 100 percent uh, tax forgiveness uh year two um 100 percent after your your built and then slides off to 80 60 40 and then drops to zero um so the business community likes that to you know for for an upfront that's for a new build build or a substantial addition addition to some existing business and on our on our um, uh, housing side of things, we do have something similar, but it's just a uh, three year forgiveness. One one is the year you're building. One is a complete forgiveness in year one, and year two is fifty percent. Okay. Um, thank you for answering those questions. I want because I'm cautious of time here. I just realized we've hit the half hour mark, and I don't. I know you're a busy man because you got many hats that you juggle. So I want to ask the flip side to my original question, which was about challenges. Now every community has its challenges, and I will be the first to admit that they all have big challenges lying ahead for them. But what's the thing you are proud about when it comes to your government administration, your council? What is the accomplishments that you boast about when you go talk to municipal leaders from across Canada, across Alberta, or even to your own residents? What's the accomplishments that you are the most proud of? Well, I I, I think there's a few of them, but uh, one is that we've we've managed to. Um, in my 20 years or 21st year as mayor, we've managed to stay away from the hot button topics that gets the community riled up. So we're proud of that. We're also very, very proud of the community spirit. And that doesn't matter whether it's someone who's lived here all their life or the newcomers that have come in. And I'm going to go back to the Filipino community. Um, we got a Filipino a gentleman on council and all of a sudden we've got two filipino associations and they're coming to council asking us what they can do for the community and if there's anything they can volunteer in and that is so incredibly refreshing because in our small communities it's normally been the same people uh, they sit on the ag society board they sit on you know they sit on all the boards um, but a lot of them are no longer with us. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think just um, we have a great relationship with our MLA and MP. Um, and I think we, again, we, we, we like to work with the government of the day. So we don't always, you know, um, myself particularly, I don't always agree with the government of the day. But if they're pushing you in a direction... Um, you have to consider that direction if you want to want to move forward. 
Okay, yeah, that, 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 sure that, that's, a, that's a loaded question, and I kind of want to ask the political question right now, Barry, but I'm not going to. Actually, you know what? You know what? Let's do it. Let's do it, because I feel like you're kind of a good okay. guy who's on the record about a lot of things. Um, yeah. uh, okay, so that's a big loaded question about you might not always agree, but if they push you in the direction, you have to kind of follow them if you want things done. So... Yeah. Is there issues right now that you wish this government, and I talk about the, this Daniel Smith UCP government, wish they would be doing a little bit better from your standpoint as mayor? Let's take the school board trustee hat off because we're talking about municipal affairs here. Is there something that you wish this government would do, but they're pushing you in the wrong direction or in a different direction, I should say? Well, I think that the one thing, I, I think they do have a few hot, button and um, things that bills that they're trying to pass here. I do I do believe that um, things always work a little better with consultation. Um, again, uh, the outcome might be um, the same after consultation, even if it's uh, consultation and the general consensus is people don't want to go in that direction. Um, I find there's always a fear if you don't uh, have any consultation um people really feel like you're you're just you're you're ramming things through so i i do wish that they would consult more on on a few of their bills um okay. please uh get rcmp was a hot button item that i just don't understand why you'd want to uh, want to continue on down that road um uh, I, i'm not a favor in favor of, um political parties and municipal politics However, I also would say that um, potentially in Calgary and Edmonton, we already have political parties and in, 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 in municipal politics there. I don't see it really affect in rural Alberta, but again, I think the consultation should have happened and, and I think uh, the outcome would be the same, but at least people would be able to air their concerns. Early on in the interview, you talked about MSI. So MSI, the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, which basically is a funding for infrastructure projects for municipalities, has been so eloquently changed to the LGFF, Local Government Fiscal Framework, which is another uh, grant for municipalities to get every year from the provincial government, which is now tied to the royal, the resource revenues. If it goes up, that's good. If it goes down, that's not good. But right now, there was a little bit of a rollback on what from MSI to LGFF. Uh, are you happy with the funding that you got? I can I, 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 I can imagine that you're always wanting more, but are, it, it, is it enough to help you guys out to help out with some infrastructure challenges? No, for, for sure. It's it's helping <laughs> out. Um, we, you know, probably about 75 percent of where we were uh in our best times with msi um however i like the idea if the province does well um we will do better and if the promise province is doing um or uh, I, I uh we won't get as much money and i guess it'd be nice to see their books because there's there's always a um i hate to say this but everywhere there is there's always a, a truth and a partial truth so, and I'm not saying anyone is not um, being honest. Just, uh, just there's there's more than one way to present a budget. And the, the age old dad is there's and always talk. three sides to any story. There's the one side, the other side, and the actual truth. And we're we're somewhere in the middle, and hopefully we're getting the truth here. Um, I, I'm cautious of time, and I want to turn to my last segment because I like it. I want to know about your community, but from a tourist perspective. What are some of the hidden gems of your community that you say, if you come to our community or if you come to our neck of the uh, Alberta, you need to come see this? What is that for you? Well, for me personally, where I, I spend most of my time at my church, which is the Troshi Golf Club, it's a beautiful nine hole uh, golf course. If people drive by on the highway. We have the world's largest golf tee um, right on the highway, 40 feet tall. Um, the, the golf course is spectacular. Uh, many people see it on the highway, stop in, come and play it. And they just fell in love, fall in love with our, our little gym. 
Um, we also have a beautiful arboretum garden in Troshu that is spectacular in the in the spring and summer months. And then in the winter months, uh, we do a forest of lights in there. And we um, getting back to uh, volunteers. Uh, this year, I think probably two thirds of the volunteers at the Forest of Lights was uh, the Filipino community. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it's just awesome. Like, the, um, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, the other thing that we have, uh, close by, well, actually I'm going to talk about this one first. So I talked about our Arboretum and we do get some bus, uh, quite a few buses, tour buses come through in the summertime. Uh, this you might find a little strange, um, but it's usually loaded full of ladies and they go to the Arboretum. And then they stop at a little shoe store called Henry Shoes. And this shoe store is known throughout the world. And I'm saying, honestly, throughout the world um, for its shoes. It's a little, I'm going to say, probably a 1,400 square foot uh, shoe store. But they got shoes stacked um, and all high-end shoes for the ladies. Uh, a lot more for ladies and men, but they do have men's shoes in there too. And the bus tours actually come here and go to the Arboretum and then they turn around, come up town, and they'll go visit one of our uh, sweet peas. Uh, that's a, a place to get a coffee and, and, and then they'll go to Henry Shoes and they will buy, they'll spend money in, in, in Troshu at our shoe store. So believe it or not, the shoe store is an economic driver for our community. Um, the other things that we have is uh, we're quite close to the Red Deer River. So we got, uh, you, if you like to float down the river, uh, you can float down the river. If you like hiking, you can hike, hike in the hills there. Uh, Dry Island Buffalo Jump Park, Provincial Park, is about uh, 12 miles from us. Again, great hiking, great rafting. Um, some people like to fish in, in, in Red Deer River. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not fishing there, but uh, we have a lot of people that do. Um, I want to get back to one question you asked me earlier about um, people wanting to get out of the city after COVID. And I would say that we have had a in, uh, influx of people who have moved from Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, and they've settled in Troshu here. And one of the reasons they've settled here is because of all the bureaucratic BS to get anything done in the cities. And they really, um, I say this, probably gonna get in a little trouble, but living in Troshu during COVID wasn't a big thing. It was, it was not a big thing. Living in Calgary and Edmonton and the bigger centers where you have public transit and apartment buildings where you got a whole pile of people, it was a big thing. Out here, um, we, we, have, we obeyed the rules, but they're, they're a lot looser. And people are coming out in droves. So again, we need to make more room for more people because we are growing. So I I was going to ask you where you go after a stressful day, but I can imagine you just go to your church and shoot nine holes. But is there a spot that you can go it, and just relax? Always. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, of course, there's a few places you can relax, but. Um, but, uh, and I forgot on the tourism side, we do have a couple of campgrounds. We have a campground at the golf course and then we have our own municipal campground. Um, our ag society has a beautiful riding arena that hosts, uh, uh, Jim Canna events and our ball diamonds. Um, we, we host, uh, some slow pitch tournaments and hardball tournaments. Um, so yeah. So my last question before I let you go here, Barry, and it's an important one. So we started by talking about you. We're ending about talking about Troshu. So in your opinion, what makes Troshu such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I can honestly say, and I'm a little biased here because I've been here for 60 years of my life, but in Troshu, um, everybody, almost everybody's friendly. Uh, we're very welcoming. We're, we're very accepting of newcomers to the community. And um, I, I, I think that's really the key. 
the negative Nellies in our community are so few and far between. People think that we don't have any, and and we do have a few, but we just have a good atmosphere. It's a there's no traffic lights in Troshu. Oh. Um, the school you got K to twelve school, so that's key. We now are building a facility to look after the people who, who built our community. Um, and 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 that was one of my passions right from when I got into uh, politics was how can we let the people who built our community have to go to somewhere 60, 80, 100, 200 miles away to end to to stay with their last days of their life. And um, one of the things on our new facility that I didn't add earlier, we will have a dementia wing on it. So there'll be a lock off 10 bed dementia wing. Which is um, which is huge. Um, a lot of people in in our in our community have had parents that have suffered from dementia, and and they get forced all over the province to find a bed. Barry, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. Your community sounds such like a vibrant place. I've said on this show, if you come on the show, I'm coming to your community. And now that I know that you have one of the best golf courses around and it's a religious holiday for you to go out there, maybe you and I can go grab a nine hole while I come out this summer, maybe in the next few weeks, and we can go shoot nine holes because I need to get back out and work on my swing because it's been a while. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you come out, uh, the golf will be on me. Awesome. Uh, Barry, it's always a pleasure to sit down with people like yourself who seem so passionate about their community and so passionate about their uh, the role as uh, mayor and councillor and even school board trustee. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. We want to also take a moment and say, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse interviews that we have coming out over the next month, we are going to be attending the upcoming Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference in Calgary, Alberta, and we're going to be sitting down with as many municipal leaders from across this great country as we can for our upcoming shows in June and potentially into July, depending on how many we have. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.